Welcome. My name is Deborah Garcia. Thank you very much for coming today. The LAC Career and Job Services Center is delighted to have you here today for our career information panel on navigating career change. Our goal is to provide you with important information that will assist you in managing your life changes during this economic downturn. We have four professionals scheduled to speak today. Unfortunately, um, our speaker, Ty Bulow, was unable to make it. He had a death in the family yesterday and had to go back to New Orleans. So uh, my condolences are with him with that. Um, please hold your welcoming applause until I have introduced all of our guest speakers. Our first panelist is Dwayne Schaefer. Dwayne has worked in higher education for over 25 years. Currently, he is the department head for counseling at the Liberal Arts Campus of Long Beach City College, which allows him to oversee the operations of career counseling services at both campuses and counseling services at the Liberal Arts Campus. He is dedicated and committed to the mission of career counseling and understands the importance career counseling plays in the lives of our student population. Duane holds a master's degree in counseling with an emphasis in higher education and a career counseling certificate both from Cal State University Los Angeles. Our second panelist is Sheila Wiley. Unfortunately, she has been detained, and I hope that she'll be able to be here before our event is over. Um, Sheila has worked in workforce development for over 10 years. Her resume includes working in human resources, youth job development, and now in her current role at Jobbing.com as a community relations director. As a community relations director for Greater Los Angeles, uh, largest local job board. She focuses on bringing fresh and relevant content to job seekers through community workshops, newsletters, workforce related blogs and videos. She also has extensive partnerships lists in her network including working with chambers, professional associations, universities, community colleges, work source centers, and other partners that meet the needs in today's workforce. Sheila Wiley also has services on a uh, also serves on a variety of human resource boards, including NAAAHR-LA, PIHRA, and serves as a mentor for other young professionals. Sheila has been seen giving job seeker tips in the media, including Fox News and Good Day LA. Sheila Wiley is committed in helping build a community, the community by providing resources that encompasses all aspects of employment. Um, the next panelist will be Javier Villasenor. Javier is an entrepreneur and educational leader in the greater Long Beach area. Mr. Villasenor is currently a faculty member at Long Beach City College. He presently serves as a counselor in the Counseling and Student Development Department, mainly focusing on career development. During his eight years at Long Beach City College, he has served as a program coordinator for Title V, Hispanic Serving Institute grant and was also elected to serve as department head in LAC counseling for two terms. In 2004, Mr. Villasenor ventured into the family restaurant business. Along with his wife Dorian, they opened a Tacos Don Chente in the city of Long Beach. He was later appointed vice president of administrative services for the TDC Corporation. His passion continues to be increased access and success in business and higher education for the underrepresented. Javier received his master's degree in education, counseling, and guidance from Point Loma Nazarene University. He received his Bachelor of Science in Public Administration, Public Policy, and Management from the University of Southern California. Our last panelist and keynote speaker is Dorothy Mitchell. Dorothy has worked as a counselor and professor for over 30 years at Long Beach City College. California State University, Long Beach, and the University of Hawaii, Manoa, uh, with degrees in community and clinical psychology. Dorothy was born in Ogden, Utah, the fourth of five siblings during the height of the Great Depression. She has been married twice for a total of 52 years and has raised four daughters. Dorothy is an international speaker, published author, consultant trainer to the U.S. Navy, and has been named Woman of the Year by the Seroptimist of California and Colleague of the Year at Long Beach City College. Her current focus is that of a life coach to assist people with challenges, changes, and choices. Dorothy strives to give them guides, lessons, and strategies for creating a successful life, no matter their personal background. 
She believes that every person is the artist responsible for creating his or her own future. Our history is either a launching pad or an anchor. I thank each and every one of our guest speakers for participating in our event and sharing their expertise. Without them, this career panel would not be possible. Please join me in welcoming them today. Without further ado, Mr. Dwayne Schaefer. Thank you, Debbie. Good morning. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I don't do presentations in morgues, so I know there's some live bodies out there. Good morning. I am glad to see those of you here, and hopefully you'll be able to take this message to those that are not here. As already, I'm Dwayne Schaefer. I'm going to talk to you today about the importance of knowing who you are. Now, when people ask you that question, oftentimes individuals can't answer that. It's like, well, I'm a female, or I'm a male, or I'm African American, or I'm Latino, whatever the case may be. But well, what makes you tick? What makes you thrive? And I think one of the things about the Career Center is that we have this tool that really assists you in getting to the core of that. Because once you know who you are and what attributes you bring to the table, then you can navigate this thing called life or this thing called a career somewhere or what the case may be. Because if you don't know that, I can tell you you should be a teacher. You may be the most worst teacher ever on the face of this earth because that's not your thing called passion. You know, what is your passion? And we, you know, the conversations I've had with students never really get to that. The tool that I'm referring to is called True Colors. I did put a website on the front of the podium, and that website has a free test if you'd like to take that. It's truecolorscareer.com. So if you'd like to go there, that would be excellent. The book that I showed before you, Follow Your True Colors to the Work You Love, is an excellent text, and I know we use this in our Counseling 48 class and in our Counseling 7 class, and I believe also in our Counseling 50. So this is an excellent test. When I taught 48 myself, this was the text that I used, and the students did not sell it back to the bookstore because they found it a great reference for them. The thing with True Colors, and what I like about it is because it's very simple. Don't let simplicity fool you. You know, sometimes think of, people think everything must be complex. Now, there is an assessment that many of us use called Myers-Briggs, MBTI. Myers-Briggs is a wonderful tool. However, it can bog people down because of the vocabulary that it uses. Very good tool used in corporate America today. However, what we find here at LBCC and other schools, we want something that's simplistic that people can remember. And we're even finding out in high schools that students are remembering this now, you know. now kind of jog back down the road and remember when you were in high school you know the things you remembered were one two and three whatever they were you didn't remember the things about yourself or what this means for me but the thing about true colors is that you have these four cards and they, each card represents a different color this is orange and I'll tell you what that means this is blue green and gold before I get started about expressing this information about these cards Please understand that no color is better than the other. Whatever is your primary color doesn't mean that it's better than the other three colors. Whatever is your last color doesn't mean it's worse than the other three colors, okay? You ebb and flow through this color spectrum. The orange card speaks of a risk taker. An individual who likes adventure, fun, excitement, um, always pushing the edge of the envelope. Do anyone know anyone like that? No? Some of you nodding your heads, very good. <laughs> but this individual is, is the individual who is creative, also an entrepreneur. You know, we have one on the panel here, and he'll talk sooner, or later, I should say. The other color here is your blue, a compassionate, a person that's feeling, an individual who cares about others and making sure that everyone is included. This individual does not like chaos, wants to make sure that all things work together for the good. Green. Green is your analytical individual, the one that wants facts and figures in making decisions. These are the individuals who don't run things by gut or the seat of their pants. Every step that they take is really important to them, and it must fit the whole organization. Last but definitely not least is your gold. Your gold individual is an individual who likes structure in life. The person who lives with their day timer, always writing down all the details of what I need to do for the day, where I need to be, they arrive on time to everything. I don't care if the car breaks down, they will be on time. So we have these four different personalities, and even as I describe them to you, 
it's very easy to understand where do I fit in that without even taking the test. Because the thing is, is that when you wake up in the morning, you don't think about this. You just do it. My primary color is orange. And I don't think about being orange any time of the day. What I have to think about, because it's my last color, is gold. As a department head and as also the president of the faculty union here at LBCC, I have to be at places. I have to do things. I have to respond in a timely manner. So keeping my calendar straight is very important for me to be successful in those capacities. But I'm here to tell you I don't think about it. But I have to work at it. Definitely have to work at it. My second color is blue. And one of the things I can tell you when you find out your color spectrum, your second color is usually what is shown. My color of blue, most people see the compassionate side of me. Most people understand I care about them. I listen intently as a counselor. I want only the best for you. Now, if I lived in my orange, I'd probably say, I don't care what you're talking about. Get on and read the book and take care of business. That wouldn't be very good as a counselor, would it? It would? I shouldn't do that as a counselor, should I? I see some people nodding heads. I just want to contradict that. No, that is not good. So the color that you see most often taking place in people's life would be your secondary color. Again, as I said at the beginning of this, you ebb and you flow through this, depending on life situations. It often changes. Sometimes you have a degree, you want to change it. You don't want to be in your primary color any longer. Maybe you don't find it being working for you. However, though, you are what you are. As you know, at age five, your personality is pretty much set. You either add to it, your values kind of change a little bit, but it's pretty much set. But the thing that, again, I love about True Colors is the simplicity and that you can walk away with valuable information for the rest of your life. Because not only is this good for a career situation, but it's also good in your relationship. Relationship with significant other, relationship with your family, relationship with your teachers. Because if you know that your teacher understands facts and figures, you go up there emotionally in a blue role, you know that's not going to work for your instructor. Your instructor needs to understand the, the bottom line, the facts, Jack. And if you can't not produce that, then you may not get the answer or get to the place that you want to get to. So understanding, true, understanding yourself first and then being able to apply this to other people in your life is very helpful. Um, one of the things that we've done with True Colors here on the campus is that YEP, Young Entrepreneurs Program, which is through our economic development program, they had all of those individuals who were interested in starting jobs, thinking creative, wanting to do something very entrepreneurial that obviously would result in some money coming to them or earning an income. They used this and really applied it to their organization and looked at what they bring to the table and what they also need brought to the table as creating a, 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 a group of people to work with. And one of the things I, uh, one of the students brought up, he went in and he wanted to do um, custom suiting. And something is near and dear to me. Many people who know me know I love fashion. But what he wanted to do was go overseas and have the suiting and the shirts and the slacks or whatever prepared there and then ship back. He had a contact there. But he realized that one of his good buddies who was working with him, he found himself to be a green gold. And his buddy is an orange. And for his entire life, he never understood his buddy. But until he did True Colors, he had a most appreciative relationship with his, new, with his friend because now he understands who he is and why he does the things that he does. Because oftentimes when we don't understand someone, we either kind of say, well, I don't need to spend a lot of time with them. I don't have time to understand. But again, going back to what I started out with, when you know you, then you know what your strengths as well as your weaknesses are and what you do need in whatever organization or relationship that you're in. I strongly encourage you to check out the website. You can purchase the book. It's 20 bucks online. It comes with these cards. There's a lot of great information with inside this book, so I'm not going to sit here and try to explain it all because I know we all can read. But the other thing I want you to pick up on the back table is that starting on Thursday, on Thursday November 19th, 2009, from 1230 to 230, there will be True Color assessments offered. Two counselors will be in there, if not one to go over your assessment results. I strongly encourage you to do this. I'm here to tell you that this 15 or 20 minute time that you may spend in this uh, event is going to be well worth it for you. Well worth it for you. I encourage you to share this with your friends, your colleagues, your peers, and have them take this test because as simple as, as, simple as, simple as it is, excuse me, you will walk away with such valuable information about who. Who are you going to have valuable information about? Thank you. This is like a you know, call and response for those who understand music. Uh, yes, it's about you. So make sure you take full advantage of that. 
Um, I will be around later for questions. And again, I am such a passion about this. Some of you may have taken Jim Ostak's class, or you may have taken uh, Mrs. Habash class. They're both speech, course, uh, speech instructors, and they have True Colors in their course every semester because they realize the importance of this. Also, child development is utilizing True Colors. So we in career want to colorize the entire college. That's from the top down, meaning the Board of Trustees, the Executive Committee, as well as our students and faculty, because it's really important to understand and be able to approach individuals because you understand what their colors are. With that, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sheila Wiley. If you can give her just a moment, she has a presentation available for you um, that she needs to set up over um, at the media equipment. It's so interesting. Thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, I was invited to talk about uh, resume strategies for career changers. And what's kind of interesting about this is I've not done this in a while, not because it's not needed, but because of with the recession and things that are going on. Basically, my, my workshops are talking about how to deal with you know, the, um, layoffs and you know, transitioning from, you know, one job, how to expand your, you know, your use at a job. So I'm like, wow, okay, trans career changers, I get to see those now. So with the economy changing the way it is, um, this is a really great topic to talk about. So I'll just take a few minutes. And again, if you want the, uh, a copy of the PowerPoint, I'll certainly be able to email it to you. And I'll have my email address at the end. But um, why do people want to do career change? I mean, that's kind of the first question that came to my mind when I um, um, put together this PowerPoint. And some of the ways that, uh, some of the reasons why I feel that people are career changing, and I'll use kind of my personal experience because I did do a, a career change from working with the government into um, public sector. And um, some of the reasons why people change careers is, you know, feeling stuck on a job. I mean, I don't know about you, but you know, you may be on a job and it's just like, you know, the same thing every day. Pick up your coffee, you go to work, you go to lunch, you go home. You know, it's like, okay. Um, no room for growth. I mean, I can definitely use that as, as an experience. I was at my last job and I was there for, am I still, okay. I was there at my last job, okay. <laughs> I was there um, at my job for about five years, as loud as I am, you would think. But, um, and so it was just, it was just, I was just there. You know, I, I loved what I did. It was an opportunity for me to help young people develop their resumes, getting internships and whatnot. But it, there was just no growth. It was just like I was just there. I was in a box, and Lord knows I don't like to be in boxes. I, you know, and I said, well, this is just, what do I need to do? So I was one of those career changers. Um, burnt out on your daily duties. I mean, you know, there are companies um, that have downsized and you were the fortunate one to stay on the job, but here's the, the catch to that. Now you are tasked to do not only your job, but the four of the people that were laid off, you know. So here you are, you know, doing your job along with the other jobs and you're just kind of like feeling a little burned out. You know, you're overqualified or you've outgrown your job. I know I've been, you know, you know, you get your job description in the beginning and you're like, oh, I could do this, this is awesome, and you go on and on and the years go by and you're like, okay, let's come on with something else. So you may have outgrown the job. You're bored at your job. I mean, you know, true enough, we need our jobs, we need to pay our bills, but, you know, there are times where you do get on Facebook and you do do other things on your computer than your daily job, so yeah, that's a sign of you're, you're getting a little bored. Not enough money. You know, um, you know, I always tell um, people when they're negotiating their salary, sometimes you want to make sure that you get to that salary that you want to get to because when it goes to, you know, getting your annual evaluations and, you know, there's budget, sh you know, changes, there may not be money, money to get an increase in your salary. Um, and then the last two is um, feeling stressed uh, as well as life change. You know, people have gotten married. That's where my name change come. I got married. I had to move on. It was like, now I'm going to get a house and, you know, need to take care of my family. And this is just not enough money for me. So those are some of the reasons why people do change. If, in fact, you do see that these fit in under your category, you have your own category, 
you want to have a pre-planning strategy. You know, I always tell people, don't go just quit your job. My goodness, what are you thinking? You want to have a strategy. You know, and, and that's where you want to say, okay, this is this epiphany time in my life where I have to decide if this is where I want to be or do I need to go. So if you, you create a career uh, pre-planning strategy, you can kind of get to that point um, where, you, where your next steps are. And some of the ways you can do that is do your um, find out. One of the things I know I did was this first one was internal transfer. Uh, you know, I looked at the job. I really liked where I was at. But it was like, okay, well, maybe I can just transfer to another department that I was qualified for and see how that works. So I put in, you know, you know at applying for some of the other jobs and later found out my boss liked what I did and was not going to let me transfer out. So it was like, okay, here I am, a fork in the road. Either I stay in, wing it, or, you know, it's all about me at that point. So um, that was one of the things that I, I know I will encourage people, if you like your job, but there's somewhere, you know, um, this campus here, it's an awesome campus. I'm sure there's a lot of areas where, you know, if you worked here, you could transfer out, or if you're going from, you know, one area. I know um, I met Dwayne originally at Cal State Dominguez Hills. He was the one that pushed me out of there, so I thank you for that. But um, then he left. I was like, oh, my gosh. You know, once I graduated and later, I know. And then I later found out he was here. So that was a transfer, and it was a great uh, transfer up. And, um, you know, here you're doing wonderful things here. So there may be that opportunity to stay within your industry, but you want to transfer out. Take an inventory of your resume. That is so important to do. Because take an inventory with your resume. You need to find out, okay, if I'm going to transfer, um, into another industry or, you know, go to another department or company altogether, you need to inventory yourself, meaning your resume, to find out what is it that you have that is transferable into the career that you want to go into. So you don't just kind of jump out there and, you know, then start looking for a job. Look at, you know, some of the things that you enjoy doing at that job or, you know, at, in your resume, some of the things that you really enjoy doing and seeing how you could just kind of collaborate that together into transferring the job. One of the things that I will say with me was, you know, I stayed in workforce development. So, you know, I stayed into the, you know, as a job developer, you know, I worked in human resources, all of that kind of, you know, um, tied into this job where I'm at right now. So that was taking inventory of my resume. Researching, I can't say enough about researching companies, finding out what's out there, finding out, you know, the industry, you know, I'm always here, I'm on NPR news, you know, listening to what's the latest, what's going on, you know, companies are you know, coming in and companies are folding out. But what companies are out there, you know, hiring in the industry that you're interested in? What is your passion and what, who's, who's out there hiring? You can do that through the Internet, um, your newspaper, of course. You can Google. But my, my all-time favorite is social network. Um, LinkedIn is probably one of, you know, I, I, I should get some stock in that because I talk about that all the time. LinkedIn is actually how I found quite a few of uh, partners um, companies, you can actually look for a job on LinkedIn, and that's L-I-N-K-E-D-I-N, um, LinkedIn.com. Create your profile on the website, um, and then that way when you, you know, it's sort of like your Facebook or your MySpaces for those MySpacers that are out there, but it's sort of like your Facebook, and you learn about the companies um, that are out there. Facebook, with our company, um, Jobbing.com, um, we work with a lot of companies creating their Facebook. Um, one of our big co um, clients, um, he is a, a sports chalet. Um, they have an actual Facebook account, so you can become, you know, a fan of theirs. One of the things I will say is that um, in your transition, and what I mentioned earlier, is a lot of times you don't want to wait and quit to go find a job. While you're working, you can start making that transition. A lot of times companies are looking, you know, to wonder, you know, well, why are you leaving the job or what's going on as opposed to, you know, explaining how you, you know, you got laid off or fired or whatnot. So, you know, be active, proactive now as opposed to reactive if, you know, something's going on. But one of the things you do want to do is create a script, you know, what we call our 30-second commercial pitch. When you start going out there and researching companies and finding out what's going on and networking with people, you want to make sure that they are, you are specific to what you're asking for. 
this is not a time where you start complaining about the job and you know why you don't like the job I, I don't like my boss you want to be proactive you want to be strategic and making sure that the information that you are conveying to people whether it's you know through inter um, through your, the internet or through volunteer and we'll talk about that briefly a little later um, but you want to make sure that you have that 30 who you are you know some of your skills and what you're looking to get into so that's that's like your 30 seconds pitch you know I do a lot of networking oh I can't that's that's like a capital capital in you know so I'm always out there and I'm talking to people and finding out what's going on and I get to hear about what industries are people looking into so when I get stuff across you know my email I, I'll be able to say all oh, right I remember that person was looking for an IT job or, or whatever so have your pitch be a be specific to what you want to um, get into and don't forget to take time, uh, oh, and I mentioned, and stay um, um, focused and um, be positive. Um, revisiting your resume again, highlighting your skills and abilities, and making sure that matches your um, job search. Um, create that cover letter. I can't tell you how many people just think cover letter is like an option A, option B. It's not an option. That is your introduction. I always use my favorite example of when I go to the bookstore, I spend my weekends reading books in the bookstore, go figure. But um, I like when I go to the bookstore, I, um, and I'll get, either it's a novel or you know, one of the self-improvement books or whatever, I always tend to go to the flap of the book first. That's your cover letter. That, in, that flap of the book will determine whether I'm going to buy the book or not or whether it interests me. And with your cover letter, what a recruiter wants to see is what is it that you're interested in why do you fit this qualification and what are you giving me on your resume? I just saw a cover letter yesterday. I was at Traytex job fair and it was a lot of people there and um, you know we pretty much have a service so I pretty much provide that free resume you know overview and just kind of give tips on what you know that's missing and and you'll be surprised what I come across but um, there was a cover letter and it just it pretty much it was like a novel I mean, the person just kind of went into their whole life and their hobbies, and, and I just looked at the person. I said, so what are you applying for? Oh, customer service. I didn't see that one bit on that cover letter. Your cover letter does that. Your cover letter introduces who you are to the recruiter, what is it that you're applying for, why you fit the qualifications, your second paragraph, your third paragraph closes it out. Three paragraphs. I don't need a novel. And then if you are transitioning, this is the perfect opportunity to talk about why you are going into this field even though you have limited to no skills in this particular area. So you can talk about I've had people who were, you know, house moms or who was in one industry and they wanted to go into nonprofit or whatever it is, that is the that's the perfect time to highlight your skills and abilities and how that ties into your qualifications and what that recruiter is going to look for on your resume. I always tell people that resume, your cover letter, just kind of can direct that person to see what they're looking for when they're looking, um, looking at your resume. Um, if you've gone back to school and you, this is, you know, here it is, you're here in school, um, you're updating your skills, you know, you're, you know, you've looked at your resume, you found that, you know, hey, this Microsoft Word 2000, you want to update it to 2006 or you know, XP, you know, Google Docs is the hottest thing in now. It took me forever to figure that from Outlook to Google Docs. And you want to just kind of update your skills. Make sure you include that into your resume. Because, you know, you get your resume out and you leave that out, that's probably one of the most important things. You're letting, letting the recruiter know not only are you passionate about what you're doing, but you're taking steps to making sure that you're qualified for it. So putting those, those additional um, skills on your resume, whether it's certificate, you know, your volunteer work. I've seen so many times um, job seekers lack their, their, their volunteer work on their resume. That's part of your resume. You did work. Take, taking that time out to, you know, um, volunteer and, and learning that craft that you are interested in, you can include that into your resume. Or if you had received an additional degree, you want to include that as well. Um, look at your resume to see if, um, again, if you need some updates and additional training that would qualify you for the job. Um, what, one of the ways you can see if, in fact, you are interested in the job is, I would say, um, shadow some professionals. You got your 30-second pitch. You've contacted some employers. Employers may not necessarily be hiring right now, but you want to make sure that this is something you want to go into. 
one of the things that you don't want to do is start job hopping. Job hopping looks really, you know, sketchy on your resume. It's like you're at one job for a year, six months, or whatever. You don't want to start job hopping. So being proactive by maybe shadowing some professionals to spend some time, you know, an hour a day, or volunteering like I mentioned earlier, just to see if this is the career that you want to get into, if this is the change that you want to make. Is it makes a big difference in terms of where you're going to go. Um, looking at new ways to develop new skills while you're on the job. I know that's what I did. I took on tasks that wasn't even part of my job because I wanted to learn that skill. So if you're on the job and you want to learn that new skill, take on. Say, hey, I want to be part of this committee. I know, you know the campuses have some great volunteer opportunities. Get on that committee, learn about that job, and you can include that in your resume and read as much as you can about that industry. You want to know what is it, what's going on, what's the forecast. You know, we talk about green jobs. We talk about the different logistic type jobs. You want to find out what is it that is actually, why is it so hot? Why is this the industry I want to go into? You know, it, the, someone had asked me, you know, what are the top jobs in the industry? It, if it's not your passion, it wouldn't matter if it's a top job. You know, I, the nursing is the hottest thing going, right? you know, to be an RN nurse or going into the different fields, but I can't stand blood, more or less, taking somebody's pulse. So what would I look like being out there being a nurse, making good money, but I hate my job and I'm back to square one? So p picking out the, the, the growing industry but making sure that that fits who you are is just as important as anything else. In closing, is this a good time to um, um, change career? There's never a good time. I mean, it's, it's, just the, it's just a matter of what you want to do. Finding an opportunity is not going to fall from the sky. It's believing in yourself and taking that risk. When I took this job three years ago, it was a big risk. I didn't know anything about the company. You know, I have to be volunteering as a resume reviewer at the job fair that they were having, and I just kind of had that feeling. I'm one of those people that have that intuition, you know. I had the feeling I really did enjoy what they were doing. I was like, I, I had that you know, as we say, the jobbing juice. If you don't know about jobbing, we, we, you can get the FIBA, as they say. And so I, I talked to people, and I talked to people, and I got both sides of the, you know, spectrum. You know, it's a dot-com. You're, you know, you're, you're taking a big risk. And I just jumped. I just kind of just closed my eyes and jumped. I do not regret it. I'll tell people I'll fight you for my job in a minute. I really enjoy it because it combined, and I, I really saw the vision of the long-term goal, it combined all the things that I've done in HR, job development, you know, internship, you know, workforce development into one, you know, and I couldn't ask for a better job, but it was taking that risk. And sometimes you just really, you can't, there's not that perfect moment to say this is the job. Sometimes you just have to take that risk. Um, and don't just sit on it. Make, make sure it fits for you um, and be creative and definitely create a plan. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sheila. Um, for the people that came late um, on our program, our next speaker would have been Ty Boulot. Unfortunately, he's had a death in the family and had to fly back to New Orleans um, yesterday. So, um, unfortunately, he will not be here to speak today. Uh, we will move on with our next speaker, Mr. Javier Villasenor. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon. I want to do something real quick. If I can have everybody... Uh, we're going to take a little quick minute break. Stand up. Everybody stand up. No, no. We're just going to stand up. Now, I want you to look to your right and look to your left and behind you and forward. And I want you to introduce yourself and please with your name and major and in, or interest. Once you're, dead, once you're done, go ahead and have a seat. If you didn't know, you just met someone else, one or two people that you didn't know before. And the most important thing that, that you're getting out of this is now you may share something or you may now know something about someone else. And that's important of networking. Uh, today, I'm here to tell you about what is important uh, of networking. 
But before I get started, I want to just go back to what uh, Mr. Dwayne Schaefer kind of said about two colors. And for me, I'm uh, orange green. For those of you guys that know, and I, I also conduct the two colors workshops. It is it's important to know what your what your passion is and who you are before you even begin networking or before you even begin doing your resumes. Because if you don't understand who you are and why you're doing something, it really is not going to mean anything. Uh, I, I, one of the things I go over with my students a lot is uh, you, about this, these myths. What are some of the myths that are out there? And, or what are some of the things your friends tell you about going to uh, a passion or career or hobby? And they'll tell you, don't ever go into a, a, ho a hobby that you really enjoy because once you start working it, you're really going to hate it. Have you guys ever heard that? Don't ever do that. Why well, dispel that? And I tell them, you know what? It's it's yes, it's true, but let me dispel why. So no one ever tells you why. And one of the reasons I always tell them is because what your hobbies are and what your passions are may be two different things. So I, I came up with my own theory. I can anybody know who Michael Jordan is? A little bit. Michael Jordan, greatest basketball ever to play in the NBA, right? Uh uh. We might we might have we might have we might have Laker fans in this panel, but <laughs> now one of the things about Michael Jordan, do you guys know what his first passion was? Baseball, exactly. So what what did Michael Jordan? He conquered basketball. I mean, he was making hoops upside down every which way you can, right? After winning three championships, what did he do? We'll go play baseball. What happens when he played baseball? He. he he, he was in the minors, probably because he was Michael Jordan, but not well enough. That, he, he, his physique, his, his talent wasn't baseball. It was basketball. What happened when he went back to basketball? Won three more NBA championships. And that's one of the things that we talk to our students. What you may love and what you're good at may be two different things. And I'll go and I'll preface again, try the true colors. And this is before you even start resume writing, before you start making a decision. Find out who you truly are. Because before you, then, you can come out and start doing networking. Because what does networking do? Why don't people do networking? You guys ever? I, lack of confidence. They don't know. It's a lack of confidence. What do I say? What do I do? These are some of the things. So that's kind of one of the things. I, I, I just wanted to preface those things, and I wanted to introduce that. Um, on the second slide, it's one of the things I really found interesting is, is did you guys know that not even 25, between 25 to 35 percent of the jobs that are out there are, are advertised? So over, you're looking at about over 65 percent of the jobs are not advertised. Two out of ten people get that, get their jobs um, through Napster or Monster or Jobster or any kind of officers that are out there. They, you will get eight more people that will get them through someone they know. And that's, and that's just the reality. It's who you know is going to help you also succeed and also get other connections or maybe other trails. Uh, as, as an entrepreneur, as someone who's in the, in the restaurateur business, you, you definitely want and you start to rely on your business colleagues, on your networks. Why? Because you don't know what you're getting into. You want to know. You you want someone who's very efficient, effective, and hardworking. And how do you find that out? You can have the sharpest, sharpest resume, because that's what we hear. We're here to teach you, to to have the sharpest cover letter, to have the sharpest resume. We even do mock interviews, get you through that. But still, as as an employer, as a business person, as a director, what ends up happening? You still don't have the right fit. So references become important. Networking becomes important. Those are some of the things that, that we have to start and students have to start keeping in mind, especially in today's market. Uh, people think, you know, yes, we are in a recession and there's no jobs. You're wrong. There's, people are always hiring. Every day they're hiring, but we just don't know about them. Next slide, why, net, why, networking, wor why networking works. I think the first, the first thing is we talked about a little bit is it provides confidence and credibility. You're able to start talking to people. People get to know who you are. You built a relationship. 
And speaking of relationships, that's one of the things I tell my students. Networking is a word that gets thrown a lot, and it's very impersonable. What I, what I like to tell my students is build a relationship with people. It's not about just grabbing someone's card. It's about connecting with someone, having, letting them know who you are and what you're doing, and reciprocate that relationship. Second thing is people really do want to help. Believe it or not, you have CEOs, directors, especially students, young students. You're coming out here. You're going out to the real world now. You're thinking, no one, no one is interested in helping me out, or how do I do it? People really care and really are looking to the next generation. How do we help out this next generation? We've gone through Generation X, Generation Y. What are they going to do? People are retiring. People want to pass down their legacy. I'm sitting here. I'm taking Dorothy's notes after this. Let me just, right, Dorothy? Yeah. Become self-perpetuating. You know, you want to ask questions. You know, find out what you can get from an employer. Questions like, who, who can you recommend I talk to next? That becomes very important. If you wait and listen, if they really, if really feel that you're genuine about your interests, they're going to refer you to one or two of the other networks or people that they know that can help you out. And it's never about getting a job or asking for a job, but it's really giving yourself out there. And also, next slide, please. It's about gaining valuable information. You know, uh, Ms. Sheila Wiley was talking about you get val find out more information about your industry. This is a great opportunity to get information about your industry and about who's, who's hiring, when, how. Very important. But, la but lastly, it leaves, it leaves a lasting impression. It becomes personable now. People remember who you are when you make an impression. One of the things I've seen uh, during my career counseling here the last couple of um, weeks is I've seen very, very talented students, strong resumes, but they've never gone out there and networked. And I'm blown back. I'm just thinking, I wish I had that position. I'll, hire you. I'll make a position for you. But I'm just telling the same thing. If I'm thinking that, imagine someone in the industry what they would say. That's, that's the importance of getting yourself out there. So it's, imp it's important that you make an effort to go out there. Uh, Ms. Wiley, Ms. Wiley talked about a couple of network sites that you can go. Uh, there's two sites that she did mention that I also view, and one of them being on the next slide is uh, Facebook. Many students are now getting into Facebook. A couple years ago, uh, two years ago, many of our students here at Long Beach City College weren't even using Facebook. And this, and this was the trend at the four-year universities. Every student, before it became public, it was an EDU. Every, every university student had a Facebook. They were connected. Now that it's public, it continues to grow. Employers, you just heard it, they continue to utilize these kind of uh, network, so, uh, internet networks to get people together. It's available too. The next slide, we talked about LinkedIn. She mentioned LinkedIn. You could find out who's, who's a director, who's an employer, who's hiring. Uh, you could find out as much information as you can through these sites. And the main purpose of these sites is to introduce themselves to you and vice versa. So you could introduce yourself to them. So these are two sites. And these, these what I've had is I have a, a half sheet page with these links as well. So you have this information. For students, for my students here at Long Beach City College, what do I also recommend? Well, join a professional school organization. We have so many special interest clubs. If you look at this place, one of the, one of the scariest things as a student is you look right in behind you, and if you look up, upstairs, go ahead and look right, up, right behind. You guys want to look upstairs? Upstairs, those, those are students. Well, that second floor, that's the associate student body floor. Many students are afraid to walk up there because it looks like it's an executive CEO is up there sitting down watching us, what we're doing over here, right? It's not. It's actually, it's, it's your floor as a student. They have so much information out there. They have special interest groups, um, student body, government, uh, social, social clubs. 
get involved. It's another form of networking or building relationships with not only your colleagues but your professors. You would be amazed if you introduce yourself to your professor with your interest of how much knowledge and information they can share with you. It, it is very, very impressive. Get, get, please get, get involved in this. Volunteer. Very important to volunteer. A lot, of, a lot, especially in the profession, professional and as a student, the way you're going to get yourself out there is to volunteer through these organizations. Put that extra work. Not everything is about monetary. It's about giving back to the community, giving back to society. And, and within that, we're hoping that it be reciprocated as well. Find a mentor. Again, we're going back down to people want to give back. People have tons of information, huge, huge, huge amount of information that they're just dying to pass it down to somebody. Find a mentor of your passion or your interest and work with them. Conduct a professional interview or informational interview, which is the second one. And for, and for those informational interviews, how many, have, how many people have ever conducted their informational interviews, professional interview? You find out so much information out there from your employer, not only from the employer, but the, the actual industry. What I get from most of my students is, what do I ask? How do I ask? Right? That's kind of like, that's, that's the main barrier, is, is how do, am I going to ask this information? On the next slide, I provided some links for you. Slide. Not my next slide, Dorothy. <laughs> the next slide. There's uh, one, of, one of the, it's a Quince, Care, Quince Career or QuinceCareer.com informational interviewing. This website, if you guys link, go into this website, it has how to, how to send an email, how to, do, how to phone somebody, to ask for a professional informational interview, how to follow up, what questions, over 200 suggested questions that you can provide. It's a really good site for you guys to come in and just visit. It gives you all, all, the, all the essentials. And this is the how. You guys, you guys will be able to have the how. In closing, um, what I, what I want to say is just the don'ts. Don't wait until you need something from somebody else. You just introduce yourself to someone, follow up. You want to make sure you follow up is very important. But more importantly, you want to make sure you give them the thanks. Send them a thank you. So after, after everything that's been said and done, just follow up and give them a thank you. Don't wait until it's a necessary thing. Be proactive about it. One of, one of the things I always tell my students is, is be positive. Regardless of, of how the recession is or how down you are, there's always help, there's always hope, and there's, there's always yourself. And with that said, I'm going to leave it to another professional, one of my colleagues, that's going to talk about life in itself. So again, remember, it all starts with what Mr. Schaefer said, before you even do your resume, is know who you are. But really treat people with respect, and hopefully it will be reciprocated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier. Just a reminder before we move on to our keynote speaker, um, the websites that Javier mentioned to you are available on that back table that's very colorfully arranged. Um, it's a half sheet, so you can pick that up. Um, at, at a reminder, at the end of the event, remember to fill out your evaluation form so that we can improve for next year. And there's other handouts available for you also on that um, back table. Um, and now our keynote speaker, Dorothy Mitchell. Thank you very much, and I want to thank my colleagues for their introduction. I have a few comments to make about their things that they said, and then I'll leave them to rest. One of them is... Um, uh, Dwayne said something about finding about who you re really are and one of the assessments that you can take is called this true colors uh, but the fact of the matter is 
it takes a lifetime to find out who you really are. The person that I was at 15 and 25 and 35 and 45 and 55 and 65 and 75 is not the same person. There's a, like a rebirth of that person on every different kind of level. So who you are now is not who you're going to end up being. It's as simple as that. The difficulty that we have, the difficulty I experienced when I was counseling here is that students would come into my office as a career counselor and ask me, um, and I would say to them, you know, why are you here? And they would say, um, the counselor told me that I didn't know what my major was and so I had to come over here and get a major. Well, first and foremost, if you're a student here at Long Beach City College, you don't have a major. I don't know why in the world they keep feeding you that misnomer because it's not true. You have an area of concentration. Your whole goal at the community college to, is to work on figuring out who you are, what you want to be, what direction you want to go in, and you certainly don't know it when you're 18 or 19 or 22. And the very few that do have kind of known it since they were two. I've always wanted to be a whatever. But most of us are struggling to find out who we are as human beings. So you don't have a major here. You have an area of concentration on. What do you want to concentrate on here to decide if you want it to be a major? That's one thing. Another thing is um, uh, our second speaker was talking about you have to ask questions. Well, I don't know if you have this problem, but in my classroom when I was a student here, I didn't ask very many questions. It isn't because I didn't have them. It's because I didn't want to show my ignorance. I didn't want all the other students to know that I didn't know that information. And so asking question is a talent that can be nurtured so that you can inquire and learn from other people's experiences. And Javi was talking about um, informational interviews, um, Oh, and, and he asked you for who, who has ever done an informational interview. And there was only a few hands go up as far as I could see. But the fact is, if you've ever dated anybody, you've done informational interviews. <laughs> I mean, you know, you find out about things by uh, getting those questions answered. So, I know a lot. I'm a very wise older woman. And I have two gifts for you before you leave, so don't let me get through, uh, through without telling you that. Um, we are in a pivot period in our society, so if you don't know exactly what's going on in our world, n neither does anyone else. We're in a pivot period. The first pivot period was the, the Crusades. That's the first time that people started to get information about other places in the world. And when those crusaders went out there and found spices and they found silks out of their hovels in England, they began to get all kinds of information and that changed the world as we knew it at that time. The second pivot period was the printing press. It was the first time that anyone could own a book. Prior to that, people only had those wonderful, beautiful handmade books that the monks made. And you and I would not be able to own a book. But now, we can have a book and we started to get information. The third pivot period was now the microchip. And now the explosion is just so huge that it is impossible to keep up. If you bought a computer yesterday, it's out of date tomorrow. So there is an enormous change going on. So if you don't know exactly what you want to be when you grow up, you're in exactly the right spot. I'm 75 years of age and I don't know what I want to be when I grow up. I have been many, many things and I didn't know it at the time when I was a student here at Long Beach City College. My career search started when I was a child and what I've discovered after 40 years of career counseling and teaching is that your life is your career. Your life. Doing your life 
is your career. And what you want to do is to find a place to serve where you can be well paid. But your life is your career. Being physically, intellectually, emotionally, fiscally, and intellectually and spiritually healthy as you can be is full-time work. Full-time work. If you happen to be a parent and you're trying to do your life and trying to guide your children, you realize that that's a multi multi-faceted career. So when I was a little tiny girl, a really little tiny girl, I was born into a really sick family. We now know it as a dysfunctional family. I had a father who was a very abusive alcoholic and I had a mother who was passive aggressive. And when I was a little girl, my mother was pregnant for the fourth time with me and she was very unhappy. She did everything she could to possibly get rid of that baby inside of her because it was a depression and my mother did not want another child. She couldn't afford it. She hadn't paid for the other three. But I hung on. October 3rd, 1934, I was born to my mother at home alone. No one knew she was pregnant. She was short and she was fat. So no one knew if she'd just gained more weight or Laura was pregnant. When they came home from school and from work, they saw a new baby. My mother told me when I was three, she was the only child she never wanted. And she told me because she was so happy she was so happy I was there because I was that good little kid that every family has. Whatever my mother said, I jumped to it and did it. So she wanted me to know she was glad I was there. But what did I hear? I heard I wasn't wanted. So I made my first career decision. I would be better than the other kids. And then she would keep me. I would be better than the other kids. So with that first decision, I decided to do more than I was asked. When my mother would say, do the dishes, I did the dishes and wiped down the counters. When my mother would say, tidy the front room, I'd tidy the front room and then I'd put in some flowers. So I always did a little bit more than I was asked. That was a career decision, do more than asked. And then when I was a little girl, I started really helping around the household and I learned a whole lot of tasks and then I got to be a babysitter. And when I was a babysitter, I found out that if you leave the house tidy and you put away the toys and you clean up the kitchen, they often give you a little tip. So I did more than I was asked. And then I found out if you tidied the house and got the kids safely in bed and then you did the ladies ironing, she paid you extra. So I did more than I was asked and I made more money and that was another thing to learn to learn about myself is that if you do more than ask and you do more than you expected, it, good things will happen to you. So that was a career decision. And then what happened was that when I was a young girl, my mother's brother called her and said, could one of the kids please come to Washington, D.C., my older sister, Laura Lee, or myself, come to Washington, D.C. and help us out because Eleanor has broken her leg and she wants somebody to help her with the children because she can't do it. And my mother said I could go because I was the best worker. I had done more than was asked and she knew I was the best worker and I knew I was the best worker and my sister never ever said a word. I didn't find out until 22 years later that my sister didn't get to go because she was pregnant by my father. He had molested us since we were children. But I didn't find that out till later. I got to go to Washington, D.C. and I totally had my life changed because I went to a real home with a kind man who loved his wife and loved his children, never beat his wife, never beat his children, which my father had always done. So I found out there was a world that I knew nothing about. When you grow up, you think your family and their values and the way you live your life is the real world. And it is so much bigger but you don't know that because it all looks like it's a movie. But if you've ever lived in that kind of situation, you realize that there's something different and available to me. Don't make your decisions too soon. When I went to Washington, D.C., I got that job going to Washington, D.C. because I'd had preparation and then I had an opportunity. And when I went there, my uncle took one look at me. I got off the train, went all by myself, 
never had been on a train before, went across the country, changed trains in Chicago, got into Washington, D.C. My uncle found me, and there I was, five foot two, about 230 pounds. I looked like the Pillsbury boy, you know, the little round ball. My husband took at that moment to make a decision that he would be my coach. And so what he did was every morning when he got up, he got me up, and we had to work out together. And then every day before he left for work, he would leave glasses of water on the counter and a few snacks on the counter, and I was deep that counter and chase those kids. And that's what I did Monday through Friday. And when he got home from work, we worked out together again. And then we sat down as a family and ate dinner, and all of a sudden I realized this is what families do. We had a napkin my very own napkin. In my home, where I came from, we didn't have a napkin. We didn't sit down together. If you grabbed some food in the kitchen, there was something there that maybe you liked. You looked at it, you spit on it, <laughs> so no one would steal it. And the family had nothing that was like a family. And here I was with the family, and I saw the way the family could be. And I had a whole new opportunity to learn. I had another career decision to make. Life is different from what I know. And then my uncle, every weekend, he would stay home with the children. And he would send me with a clipboard out to everything beautiful in our nation's capital. And in the clipboard, I had to answer the questions before I could come home that day. One of the questions would be like, how many stairs are there from the street to the top of the Supreme Court building? And I would run up those stairs and count them. And then it would say, how do you get from the Washington Memorial to the Lincoln Memorial? And I'd find those two memorials, and I would make a little map. Then he would say, where is the two-headed snake in the Smithsonian? Well, if you've ever been to the Smithsonian, it is an entire world of its own. And you can go there every day and never see the whole thing. So I ran over the Smithsonian. What does it say on the plaque of the FBI building? I'd find the FBI building and I'd write it down. So I had a chance to see a world that I knew nothing about. That opportunity broadened my horizons, but the main thing about that was that also I was running. I was eating less. Guess what happened? That 230 pounds little girl shrunk down to 140 in three months. And I was this new woman. But what they did not see at my home when I went home is that the inside had changed. I now had dreams. So I learned another thing about a career. You have to broaden your horizons. You have to look at a world you know nothing about and test it out. So when you're going to school here, those of you who are going to school, get a part-time job. Volunteer somebody so you can see the inside of the job. Because everything looks good on the outside. Anything that makes more money than you looks good. But on the inside, you want to find out what it's like. If you have an opportunity here to become a teacher aide, you can find out what it's like to be a teacher because you'll be get going into the teacher's lounge. You'll be working after school. You'll get to see what it's really like. If you have the dreams of being in the medical field, go and volunteer and be one of those teen guys that go into the center and they work out and they work, do things for the nurses and they carry flowers and they carry books and you will find out what nursing is all about. So test the waters. When I finally got home, uh, my sister left. She got married. Now here I was home alone with a father who was abusive, with a mother who wasn't available and she was leaving and what was I going to do now? Well, I looked around and I looked around. I didn't think about running away from home because my brother had done that four times and they always brought him back. The police brought him back, so I didn't do that. I didn't have the skills to go out and get a job because I wasn't college material. I didn't know how to type. So I looked around and I found this tall, six foot three basketball player who was an airman at Hill Air Force Base. Tall was good. And then he bought me a coat for my birthday, the first coat I'd ever had of my own, not out of a Goodwill box, not the granny had passed down, but my coat. I thought, oh my God, he's rich. And then he took me out to dinner to a restaurant that had a tablecloth and napkins. And I thought, oh my God, he's got class. Okay, he's tall, he's rich, he has class. And his home is in California. For those four reasons, at 16, I married my husband. 
to get the hell out of Utah and my abusive home. So when we got married, I finished high school, thank God, and I said to him, I want a real job, I don't want babysitting, I don't want housework, I don't want ironing, I don't want a real job. So I looked at the paper, the paper's a good place, right? Looked in the paper and it said they were hiring trainees at Wonder Bread in Ogden, Utah. Trainees means they'll train you, okay? So I went into Ogden, Utah, I went to the Wonder Bread and they hired me. And I became a snowball dipper. You know those cupcakes with the marshmallow and the whip and the coconut? Well, they're made by hand. A big barrel of cookies are coming down towards you, and you have a big bowl of marshmallow in front of you, and you're dipping in it, and you're flipping off these round things with your thumb. I can flip off now like anybody. I can do that. And that was a trainable skill. That is a commodity you can sell. If you have skills, you can sell it. So I got my next job, which was a tomato core for Hunt's Tomatoes. You're standing in front of a spinning knife, you put the tomato on the knife and it whips it out, and then you put it back on the table for people to steam and peel. So I did this all day long, and I didn't miss. I've got my thumbs. Okay, so now I had experience. I had job skills. My husband got out of the Air Force. We came to Long Beach, California, because this was his home, and he was coming to Long Beach City College because he is a basketball and baseball star and he was coming to Long Beach City College. So he came to college and I started looking for a job. Now, I didn't know that there was a fish factory at Terminal Island, or I would have gone there, because I had factory skills, right? But I read the newspaper and thank God I had that skill. My number one skill is I can read. Oh, I can read. And I read in the newspaper they were looking for a PBX person and a cashier person at a yardage store down on Pine Avenue in Long Beach. And I read to myself and I thought, cashiering, PBX, how hard can that be? So I went to the store and I said, I can do that. I did that on my last job. And they didn't ask me for a resume. They didn't ask me for a demonstration of skills. They didn't ask for any references. They were probably desperate. And they hired me. First day on the job, I go in there and I said, the cash register I had at the last job wasn't quite like this one. So they taught me how to do it. And I said, the PBX board I had at my last job wasn't quite like this one. So they taught me how to do it. And then I had on-the-job training. Now, they didn't have it at that time, but I had it. So in about 10 days, I wasn't making any errors, and I was just going along doing a really great job. And about three months later, I realized I hadn't had a period. Well, I was a fairly bright 16-year-old. I could have been pregnant. We had been doing it a lot. <laughs> and I was pregnant. And in those days, you could not work out in the public if you showed. That was the term. If you show, they're going to fire you. So I could see the end of my little job right there, you know. So I didn't show as long as I could. I wore little loose dresses and things that wouldn't show. And then finally, I knew it was getting that time that I was going to show. So I said to my young husband, student here at Long Beach City College, if you buy me a sewing machine, it's $5 down and $5 a month. I can make the baby's clothes, and I can make my maternity clothes, and I can make all our Christmas presents because I can buy all the fabric before I quit here because I get 10% discount. So he bought me the sewing machine, $5 down, $5 a month. He never asked me if I could sew. I had no clue. But I had the gift of reading. And when you buy a sewing machine, they give you a book. When you buy a pattern, they give you directions. So that is just like going to college. If you just buy the book, read the book, and do the directions, you can graduate college. This is not scientific work here. This is just doing all the steps. This is part of your career training. If you can't do college, you can't do a career. How are you doing your career right now, which is going to school? Your job requirements right now are being a student. How are you doing your job?
Do you have great pride in being a student? Are you a scholar student? Or are you one of those kids that goes in there and warms the chair with your butt? Filling in the box. Because how you do this is how you'll do everything. Why do you think employers like to look at your high school, college records? And some of them do. Because they want to see how tenacious you are, how persistent you are, how committed you are. The best thing about going to college is you learn how to learn. You don't necessarily learn your career. A lot of people I have counseled at this college come back because they've gone all the way through college to do this wonderful career they wanted to do, only to find out, I hate this. I hate it. And then they come back and want to renegotiate or renavigate or redirect their career. And I promise you right now, it's never too late. It's never too late. You can change any time you want. Your career, your life is in your control. If you do work that you hate, you are dying every day. Every day. So you want to, I forget which one of the three, probably all of them said that doing that work that you love, the work that you have a passion for, you never work a day in your life. I was here for 30 years. I never worked a day in my life. I loved every minute of it. I loved it so much that when I retired, I still teach my class. I love it. I don't do it for the money. I do it because I love the joy of seeing the light go on in somebody's head when they finally got it, when they got that concept. My life is career. My life is working on me. That is my career. But finding a place to serve, oh my God, what a, what a wonderful life you can have. Wonderful life you have. When I was at home sewing, I said to my young husband here at Long Beach City College, one night after I fixed dinner, one night after I had the house clean, one night after the little girls, all three of them now, we had three little girls, they were bathed and they were clean and they all smelled good. I said to him, could I please go to college? That was a big career decision. Could I please go to college? Here I am with three little kids, a husband who takes a lot of care, and I'm asking, could I please go to college? And he was very quiet. And then he said, yes if you don't let it interfere with your real work, which I, of course, knew. I was a wife. I was a mother. You know, I had, I had a job. And so I started at Long Beach City College. And I don't know how you felt on the first day that you came on campus and you finally got into a class, which means if you ever got into your first class at this college, you are college material. Because that thing can throw you off target so quick all the little loopholes that you can fall into, just getting into a class, getting your class. Okay, so you're sitting in your class. I sat in my class, English one. And I loved it. I loved the joy of learning. I knew my career was my life at that moment. I knew that learning was something I had to do till the day I died. I feast on learning every single day of my life. I study, I read. It wasn't just getting a degree. That's just a piece of paper. I never went to one single graduation because that wasn't important. What was important is I learned. What a wonderful thing to be able to learn. So, When he said yes, started my life in a whole new direction. I found out that you can't be a perfect wife and a perfect mother and a perfect human being on the 24 hours a day that God gives you. How was I going to be a perfect student? 
because you know I only had that one word perfect. So I started setting my clock 15 minutes early until my body was used to that. And then I set it 15 minutes early until my body was used to that. And then I set it 15 minutes early until my body was used to that. Till I was getting up every single day at 4 a.m. And I would study between 4 and 7. At 7 o'clock, I would put my books away. I would wake up my husband. He would go and get in the shower. When I was up studying at 4 o'clock, my house was cold, so I had the oven on in the kitchen where I studied. But you can't just have the oven on because that's costly, so I would always bake something, some kind of bread or something for the day, bake something. And so when I got my husband up, he would take a shower. I'd take his towel. I'd put it in the warm oven. And when the shower went off, I'd deliver him his hot towel. Then I'd lay out his clothes, and I'd make his lunch, and he'd go to work. And then during the day, if the three little girls went down at the same time, I could get another chapter in. And so I studied three hours every day, every morning. Can you imagine what it does to your scores, your GPA, if you studied three hours solid every single day? Even the dimwit that I am could be an A student. Because you study three hours a day, and then maybe an extra hour. Well, I loved it. Then when he came home from work, he came home late because he was a basketball coach at Lakewood High School, and he he would sit down in the green leather chair. I would take his dinner out of the oven, put it to him on the tray. He would sit down there, put his feet up on the hassock. I would take off his shoes and socks, and I'd put oil on his feet, and I would give him a foot massage. And I did that for 18 years, because that's how long it took me to go to college. But I was going to be 18 years older anyway. And every single step along the way, I learned that my life is my career. Now what I want to do is find something I'm passionate about that will pay me very well. Because I figured out as a young woman, if I'm going to leave my home and go to work, which I needed to, he was a school teacher, we didn't make much money. But if I was going to leave my home and go to work, I was not going to make six fifty an hour J.C. pennies. I was not going to go work at McDonald's. I was going to do work that was a profession. And if you want a profession, what do you have to do? You got to have the papers. You got to go to school. You got to have some kind of skill, ability, or some kind of thing that give you credentials so that you can work out in the world to get the kind of pay that you want to get. Because at the end of eight hours, you're tired. Whether you're doing work at your desk or whether you're lifting stones with your back. You're tired. So I'd rather be tired at $50 an hour than $6.50 an hour. I have more choices, right? I'm not a stupid person. Figure that out. And all the time I was going to school, I had these three little kids. Now I had four little kids. I had all this stuff going on. But my kids saw me study. And when I was taking biology at this school, they had field trips. And I would drag my little kids along on the field trips, and they would learn what a geode was and what the flora and the fauna was. When I was in the history of California with Dr. Ada Stone at this college, who was the fiercest teacher we had, and I would go out in San Bernardino Valley because I was doing a report on the vineyards of the San Bernardino Valley, I drug my little kids. When I got my kids in the car to go anywhere, they got a stack of cards, three by five cards, question on one side, answer on the other. They would ask me the questions, I would give them the answer. They would give me the answer, and I would give me the question. So I was learning in little chunks, which is the way you're supposed to learn, right? Little chunks. So I was studying, and my kids were hearing it. When I was in one of my classes, I asked if I could bring my fetal pig home to my house and keep it in my fridge. And the teacher let me. You know, you don't ask, you don't get. So I'm carving a pig on the kitchen table. My kids are watching me dragging, you know, all this stuff out. You have to draw pictures up. Well, my kids saw that learning is the way to go. My oldest daughter is a doctor. She's the person who just completed the first book on domestic violence for all the universities in the world. It's called Intimate Partner Violence by Dr. Connie Mitchell. 
she had a dream and she followed it because she wanted to find a way to serve. Now she's working on domestic violence and early maternity and she's working for the state of California in the health department. My second daughter is a doctor. She's the head of English as a second language at Miami Dade Community College. She was so thrilled with doing her work, but her passion, her passion, the thing that they talked about, her passion was animals. So after she had her doctorate, she went back to her local community college and got an AS degree in animal science. And on weekends, she works for a vet. She said, Mom, the only mistake I've made is I didn't become a vet. She said, I thought it'd take too long. She said, I didn't at that time realize I might live a long time. Students used to say to me, well, I'd like to be an ex, but it takes a long time. And I would always say to them, well, how long are you going to live? Follow your dream. Follow your dream. Your life is your career. So Connie's a doctor. Christy's a doctor. Carol was my number three daughter. She was an American Airline flight attendant for 15 years and 15 days. And she was crushed to death by a boy, a little 12-year-old boy on his grandfather's jet ski. Um, when she was at this community college, she went to see a counselor and he totally overwhelmed her and she said, I can't do all that. So she went to another community college and was, became a psych tech. While she was in the psych tech program, she looked around the room and she saw all these older women taking psych tech. And she came home and she said, Mom, I can be a psych tech when I'm old and ugly. But she said, I'm young and beautiful. I think I'll be a flight attendant. So she was for American. And when she was killed, it was probably the most impactful experience of my life. Don't know if you've ever had a child killed or die, but um, you never prepared for death, even when you know it's imminent, but this was a shock. And um, I didn't think I could ever recover, but my life is my career. And as I lay in grief, I said to my husband, this is my second husband, I said, Brian, when will this pain be over? He's a Top Gun naval pilot and he's seen a lot of death. And he said, never, Dorothy. He said, that's not the question. The question is, do you have the courage to do what's necessary to live the rest of your life? And that's the question I place to each one of you. Do you have the courage to go for the career of your passion, of your dreams, that work that you love, because you've already got that career. That's your life. Doing the work that you love is your service that you can give back. Your career is you. My fourth daughter was born blind, and I was really pissed off at God for that when I said, you know, why me, God? And God said, why not? You got three kids, you got a good husband, you got a good life. You'll teach her a lot and she'll teach you more. And of course she has. Carrie is a very, very interesting person. She said, uh, I don't want to go to Long Beach City College, Mom, because I only want to learn one campus. So she started at Cal State Long Beach. She got her degree in industrial psychology. And she married a guy she met in high school. He's a, uh, currently a captain in the Navy. And she, um, he was going to go to the language school in Monterey. And they said, if there's any room, your wives can go to language school also. And there was room. So Carrie went to the school in Monterey and learned Japanese. She's fluent in Japanese. Now, when she went to Japan, the admiral from Japan came, sent his aide over to find out if Carrie would be a problem for the Navy since she was blind. Because, you know, they don't let blind people out of the house in Japan. I don't know if you know that, but they keep them at home. 
And in fact, I don't know if you know this or not, but in Japan, some of the people are purposefully blinded so they can become masseuses. Well, so Carrie goes to Japan. She speaks fluent Japanese, and they seat her between the two admirals, the American admiral's wife and the Japanese admiral's wife at all the events. And Carrie ends up teaching at the Japanese Defense Academy in Yokosuka. So she's leaving now Japan. She's going to go to another foreign country, Mississippi. And in Mississippi, she goes there and she calls the people that are supposed to help handicapped people with work. And they said, ma'am, you already got three more credentials than we got, and I am the head of this department. The only place we put blind people is in the broom factory. And Carrie said, I don't think you can help me. So she found her own job. When they left Mississippi and went to Washington, D.C., she sent these fabulous resumes. And every job wanted to have an interview. Every job wanted to have an interview. Every time she went in for the interview with her guide dog, oh, suddenly the job wasn't just right. So Carrie called me every day. Nobody wants to have a blind person. They won't even give me a chance. And I said, Carrie, something better coming, honey. Something better coming. Some other way to serve is coming. So she got an opportunity to take the training with AARP to be a phone representative. Well, now a blind person could do that, right? So she goes there and she has a braille card for her computer that allows her computer to speak to her. But her card wouldn't work. So the next week, she, she did the test the first week and aced it. The next week, the company from the card came down to help her. And her card still didn't work. So her company said, I don't know what we're going to do. Carrie said, well, I guess I can't have the job. But she aced the second test. They said, we've got to figure this out. They come back the next week and they said, there's a gadget that goes in front of your computer that gives you all the braille cells and you'll be able to do all the work you need to do because it will tell you what's on the screen. And it's only $27,000, so if you buy that, you can have the job. Carrie called me, she said, Mom, if I thought this was a job of a lifetime, I'd ask you to buy it. And I would have, somehow I would have. But she said, I don't know that. So she went back to work and she said to her bosses, I can't afford that and I'm not gonna go into debt for it. And they said, well, wait a minute, Carrie. Let us figure this out. Four days later, they come back and they said, we'll buy it for you. She said, what, what if I don't like this job and want to quit? They said, you could take it with you. That was seven years ago. She's now the head of communication between AARP and Congress. She now makes $90,000 a year from a person whose first job was 17. There is nothing that's impossible. The focus must be your life. You will find a way to serve, but your career is your life. Your career is your life. I've learned a lot of lessons in life. The major lesson I've learned was from Carol's death. And every experience that I've had that has some end of tragedy to it has been a great gift to my life. I didn't feel it at the time, but everything is a gift and you just need to figure out what you're gonna learn from it. In Carol's death, I learned one, forgive everyone of everything, including yourself, immediately if possible. No one's perfect. Number two, look for what's right about every person, place, and thing. including yourself, and let the rest go. And number three, nurture yourself every day. Every day. Do not wait for your birthday or Christmas. This day is the only one you really have. You can plan for tomorrow. You can plan for the future. But you got no guarantees. So this day, are you doing what you really love doing? Are you living your life, your career, with passion?
the most important gift you can give yourself for your career and for your work where you will serve is your health. Your number one priority is your health. Without it, you can do nothing. So work on your health every single day. Your emotions need to be nurtured. Nurture yourself on a regular basis. Don't wait for someone to acknowledge. Those of you who are here and who work at this college, they always give you one of those free calendars. Many of you who are students here have calendars you carry with you. Every day, write one thing you did today that was to improve the quality of your life. And one thing you did today to improve the quality of someone else's life. It's important to nourish yourself and to nourish others. Three, your intellect is, has no boundaries. You can continue to grow until you take your last breath. Study something every single year that is difficult for you to comprehend. Those brain cells are just like the muscle in your arm. If you don't exercise them, you won't have them. Learn something that challenges you. Number four, be fiscally responsible. There's so much junk out there in the world they want you to buy and pay payments on. Is it something you really need? Or is it something you just want? And are you willing to go into hawk for it? My husband said to me, Dorothy, we don't pay interest. We earn it. No credit card debt. They just want to sell you S more of the same stuff. And you know, they haven't quit making stuff. Have you noticed that? They keep making more stuff. You think you've got all the stuff you want, but they make more stuff. And finally, your spirit. Your spirit is your career. How you treat yourself, how you have a relationship with whatever universal spirit that works with you. Your God, your eternal father, whoever it is, or whatever it is that gives you the passion to admire the beauty of a flower and the growth of the grass and the opportunity to learn and grow and go to school. We are so blessed. You are responsible for your career. And trust me, the job, the ability to serve others will always be there. You will find it, but find it with joy. One of the things I'm leaving you is this little card. It says, you are looking at the face of the person who is responsible for your happiness. Take a couple, put them on your mirror. Remind yourself every morning, I tell my students this on a regular basis. If you ain't happy, look in the mirror. My case, if I ain't happy, I look in the mirror because that bitch is making my choices. <laughs> and I have another little gift from you, one of my favorite authors, Albert Schweitzer. He said, I do not know what your destiny will be, but this I do know. The only ones among you who will be truly happy are those who will have sought for and found a way to serve. May you find service and live your career. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Let's give a round of applause for all of our panelists. At this time, we begin our question and answer, answer session. If you have a question for our panelists, please line up here on the ramp, and you'll have the opportunity to um, ask your questions. <laughs> oh, you got the cord this way? Thank you, Larry. Hello. Hi, everyone. My name is Robert. I want to thank you guys for coming out here and spreading your knowledge and your wisdom. It is greatly appreciated to all the four of you. Um, my question at the moment is for Sheila, probably for any of you guys who cares, care to answer. Uh, I am an introvert as an individual, speak of knowing yourself, and I know that a major flaw in my
career game is to network. And I don't get a lot of energy from people, so it's kind of hard for me to reach out to network. What type of what type of mentality should I have, or what should I do to break myself out of that to build my networking skills? Oh, okay. Um, I'm actually an introvert. I, believe it or not, I if I had to go in front of someone and you know, like, kind of presenting on things that I'm aware of, I'm fine with. But part of my job is I have to do like cold calling. I'm like, oh my gosh, you actually want me to call a stranger? So one of the things that I know that I do is I, f I find people that know people. You know, so, you know, my, either my friends or my colleagues or someone on Facebook or LinkedIn that I can say I can connect with. I say, oh hey, you know, I'm trying to get connected with the, um, the women's in construction. You know, just as an example, I, I, the president, you know, was, is probably going to totally intimidate me. But I know someone who's either on the board or I know someone who's attended the meeting. I try and find out who's, who I can connect with to introduce me. And from there, I'm home free. So that's kind of what I do now. That doesn't always um, work out. Um, and, you know, when that happens, you know, I just kind of like, you know, I kind of psych myself out. It's like, okay, it's just, you know, another opportunity for me to talk to someone. What's the worst thing that they can say is no. You know, I may fumble, I may get started, but, um, you know, I try and find someone that knows that person. You know, in, in your career transition, you know, you may know someone that's familiar with that particular area start talking to them and then from there, you know, this it just kind of snowballs and before you know it, you know, as they say, six degree between separation, it never fails. I didn't believe that. But I end up finding someone that knows someone that knows someone that I want to meet eventually. So um, I, I believe it or not, I'm just like, oh, if I have to talk to someone cold turkey, uh, oh, I'd rather draw blood. <laughs> so that's just my suggestion. I, I also want to add that um, one of the things for introverts, you, it's preparation. I think it helps out a lot of introverts. And also, the misperception that because you're introvert, you're antisocial, right. that's not even the case. I think one of the most social people I, I do know, they're introverts. But introvert being where your energy's at at that, at that moment, and so, you know, that's great, great advice, Sheila. It, it, I would say preparation. You know, go to your sanctuary as an introvert where you get your energy from, where your high level energy, and where you're gonna be at your best, is going to be when you're reading a book, uh, listening to music, taking a walk, preparation, then go to the network. But before you even go there, I would also say is, you know, visit some of our sites and have, you know, Sheila talked about that 30-second pitch. Be prepared because conversations will come up from there. But, at the, you know, again, as an introvert, it's, it would be all preparation. Know your questions. Um, psych yourself out you know, take a walk, play some basketball, something, then go out there and believe it or not, you will be the social being. You know, Dorothy also made a comment about, you know, when you're dating, you get to know someone, you're interviewing, you're figuring out whether or not you want to go on the next date with them. Uh, so it's, it's asking questions. I mean, I know that sounds very simple, but it is asking questions. And if you're talking to someone who has the information that you need, you really view them as the, the information source. So even though you can't have the book, talking to someone who can give you some great detail in what the environment is, just ask, and, and believe it or not, they'll carry the conversation for you. Because, you know, people like talking about themselves. Sheila likes to talk a lot. But anyway, uh, that's something you might want to think about is just, as Javi already said, being prepared, understanding what you need to know. And I was even thinking, go to Toastmasters and do some, some of that work as well because that kind of helps break that whole thing of being able to present. And they help you, it's in a nurturing environment, so it's not like you're, you know, unless you want to take a speech class, you know, there's Jim O and there's some others over in the speech area. But being able to be out front, because you have your stature, uh, even though I'm an extrovert, as you probably can tell, when I went to high school, my English instructor told me, the best thing you have going for you, Dwayne, is your mouth. Go into the speech class, learn how to utilize that, and you'll go far. And I'm here to tell you, my mouth has taken me a long way. But I also had to listen, too. So it wasn't just me running off, but understanding that speech and being able to be out in public and talk to people, oh, my God, 
that is as, uh, as, as astounding that people have a bunch of nerves with that. I don't. I'll get up all the time and talk to people, you know. So um, I strongly encourage you to do all those things that have been shared with you, but also take it a little bit further. As Ed Dorothy says, educate you, your life is your career. And if that's the, the piece that's getting in the way, then let's work on getting that out of the way. I have something to say on this. I think right. one of the best things you could possibly do is to start identifying what are the benefits of being an introvert. I mean, there are great benefits of being an introvert. And you start identifying them. One of the things I have found is that introverts are superb listeners. And there is nothing more than the extrovert who loves to talk, who loves an introvert who's willing to listen. <laughs> so I think probably a good starting place could be helpful would be to find out what are the strengths of being an introvert. I happen to be married to a very introvert husband, and it is wonderful to see how he can be comfortable in his own life. He's at ease wherever he is because his world is him. And he can listen to anybody. He can add if they ask information, but he never dominates. You have that ability. Identify the strength of being an introvert. You don't have, you know, there is some no magic about being an extrovert. There's a really good magic about being an introvert. You make fabulous counselors. You're willing to listen. We have another uh, person for the questions. Good afternoon, my name is Elle, and I presume that I'm in the minority. I'm probably the only person that has been followed for the last past 12 years. Wherever I go, I'm followed 24 seven, and the people that are following me slander me and so I'm in the process now of suing them. And so consequently, the last seven years, I have been too afraid to come out in public, let alone to get a job. So this year, through God's grace, I am enrolled at Long Beach City College. And I want to know specifically how I can use those very, very painful 12 years in, in my career and make that count. In other words, to use that experience and not be used by that experience. I have a clue because I couldn't understand what she was saying. What's the question? I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. Okay. During the last past 12 years, I have been followed, stalked, harassed, have my phone calls listened to, and as a consequence, I've spent quite a bit of time at home hiding out. So I want to find out in an interview situation in, in terms of attempting to navigate my career, how can I use that experience? In, in, in other words, I have been traumatized, I've been hospitalized, and now I'm just in a, in a situation where I can actually sue the people that have caused me such pain. So I want to know how, uh, in terms of what to think, how I can use that experience rather than to be used by that experience. I don't think it's um, uh, a question that I, as a pretty knowledgeable person could answer because I don't see this is the time for you to be interviewing and seeking a job. I think this is time for you to be working on wholeness. If you're a student here at this college, every time you're in the classroom, you have an opportunity to mingle with people who are gentle and kind and you can learn how to be in the real world because the world you have been in sounds like a horrible place to be. I don't see as that as a useful experience to use out in the world of work unless you want to go and, I don't know, work in a prison or something because that's a horrible way to have to spend the last 12 years. Sounds to me like it'd be a really good time to do some healthy healing to know that the world is not made up of cruelty. If I can kind of add on what 
you're saying um, you, you I think I heard you mention how can you use that as part of your interview um, that's not something you want to probably bring to the table you know when you start going into a career um, like you mentioned you know um, learning and moving forward from it um, career wise I'm not sure it, it, again it goes into what your passion is but um, moving forward I think would like you mentioned would probably be something you could continue to grow at and and develop you know just your your inner self and learning the strengths from that and just developing yourself as a person and you know moving forward from that I think also it depends on the career you're going to go into. If you're going to go into some realm of help, uh, helping profession, perhaps helping those um, who have experienced what you've experienced and know what steps to take, because sometimes it's not a book to go to. Sometimes people don't can't afford an attorney. Maybe they have a paralegal. So it, it it all has its place, and that's the thing you want to find is what is that place and where do you feel comfortable? Because everyone doesn't feel comfortable disclosing what they've gone through, but maybe can put together a process for others something to think about. Thank you. Um, is there someone else with a question? I have a question. Um, after you've gone through putting your profile up on LinkedIn, and is it a good idea to put reference of your LinkedIn on your cover letter and your resume? Because, you know, like I've gotten references finally now on there from employers and a past employer. So is it good to present that in your cover letter, just put it in your resume or both or what? Well, it's kind of, with your cover letter, you're just basically, with your cover letter, you're basically just kind of introducing who you are, your experiences that qualify you, and then you're closing out letting them know that you, you know, have your resume as part two. Um, when you, it's, it's kind of a catch-22 because I've talked to recruiters and, you know, that question kind of came about with a job seeker. Should I put my LinkedIn link on my cover letter or should I not? And believe it or not, recruiters, when they are um, looking uh, and making that decision, they're actually going to do some research on you and they're going to pull up your, they may even pull up your information. So, it, you know, it's kind of like, Social networking is, is new to the sense where um, it's not re uh, legal in the sense where if they don't, you know, if they look at your, you know, like your LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, they can't make a decision whether they can't hire or not. But it's, what's important to note is that whatever social network that you do choose to provide that information, make sure that you want them to see it. Because as I've talked to students on the, on the younger side, you know, they have their Facebook and they got their pictures, their beer in their hand and the thumbs up. That can actually hinder you from getting a job because they're doing as much information they want you to be a fit. So um, to add it onto your, onto your resume, it, it's not really um, determined if it's a yes or a no. But what is true is that they w um, recruiters do look at some of your social, they'll type in your name and they can find out information about who you are. And from there, they can kind of look at stuff. But, you know, they're not, that's not going to determine whether they're going to hire or not. It's just something that they will look at. So um, whether you... If you, if you have some good references, and I know you're going to chime yeah. in, then... Yeah, I, I, would, I would say the same thing because... Uh, you know, with LinkedIn, you know, the references have to be approved. But what I, what I would have to say, just on, on my personal experiences being, and being in committees and hiring committees, really just make sure the best thing is going to, the best advice that I can give is that whatever reference you choose, because it, it is a double edged sword, it, is make sure that those references are good. Because people add references for whatever reason, stature, or maybe look good. And when you call, contact those references, they come out negative. So for you, it's a double-edged sword. It's a, it could be a positive because people get there at the same time. You know, you're really putting a barrier there or a red flag or, or any kind of flag, you know, for someone to do some additional research. So, you know, I, you know, I, would, I wouldn't recommend it personally, especially if you're going through the process, wait until it comes up. We're not there yet. I, you know, as she was saying, it's something new, social networking. And there are, have been a lot of cases where, you know, people do get upset because they don't get that interview because of the social networking 
uh, avenues that they have. I'd like to add just a little piece, and that is uh, my experience is don't ask, don't offer what they don't ask. Typically, just saying references available on request. If they want them, they will ask. And just like Javi said, make sure that the references that you give are really going to be good references because sometimes they say one thing to you and sometimes on the phone they will say something entirely different to the person who's doing the investigating. But in any interview, don't offer what they don't ask. Unless it's something to really shine on your, your light on you. Thank you. We have about four minutes left, so I have time for one more question. Appreciate this. Also, my question is, you know, I have, you know, I haven't been in school in over 35 years, and I'm used to just if it's leaking, tighten up the boat. You know, it's it's pretty basic. Put a new gasket in. How do you stay focused when you've been out of the system of learning for 35 years? Oh, yeah, right. Sure, I'll do that one. Um, how I stay focused is I put blinders on my space. If I am going to be a student, then I set a time aside and a place aside where I know that I can totally be there. When I was a very early student, I would read a little bit and fall asleep because it was too much information. I was just on overload. Then I got myself a dictionary and thesaurus, and I began a system where every word I did not know, I looked up, I put it in the margin of my book so that I would have one more word, so that by the time I was finished with a paragraph, I might have four or five new words because my vocabulary was extremely limited on my early attempts to college. But that habit remains with me today. I never pass a word up. I look it up. I'm really thrilled now that Google works so nicely because I can just put it on Google and find out immediately. But it became a, a, like a little light that turned on and kept me focused back on what I was trying to achieve and what I was trying to do. There's a lot of things, Alan, that will take you down a different road. Are you really, truly wanting to be a student? then you can be a student. Set up an environment, stay focused on that moment, and give yourself little triggers that will bring you back to that moment. If I can. I'm going to jump in front of you. <laughs> the other thing is reward yourself for the work that you do. Because you, you, know, you can't be a student all the time, but Dorothy is right. Turn out all those things that you don't need, and if you give yourself an hour, two hour, whatever it's going to be, then afterwards, you know, if I do this for two hours, I can do you fill in the blank of what is your reward. I mean, we've all been in grad school up here on this panel, and I'm here to tell you, there are some classes that you take, you like, why? But you know you got to get that class to get that piece of paper, as Dorothy talked about earlier. So you do what you need to do by all means necessary, but you got to reward yourself when you do this, this, this work that is working for your life. Sorry. Just the uh, setting short-term and long-term goals. Um, making sure that you know you you know plan you know because I going through school I, each semester I would make sure that I'm on point talking to my counselor making sure everything is okay but when those you know the long-term goals is this is you know it's like someone told me with an end in mind congratulations first off I, I meant to mention that I mean for you to come back after so many years that that's commendable you know. So um, setting those short-term and long-term goals, I remember when I uh, started at El Camino College, I um, took some, and I don't know if you guys have those personal development classes, how to test taking, um, you know, reading. Okay, I love those classes. They are short-term classes. You know, they kind of get you just kind of on point on what's going on. And then checking in with your counselor. I mean, you know, um, Ken Keyes over at El Camino, he was, he was fabulous. He just kind of, you know, I just kind of say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing, what's happening. You know, staying with, you know, being involved with your teachers, letting them know if you're, you know, going through, you know, some chapters that you're not familiar with. Surrounding yourself with students who are like-minded like you, um, getting involved. I think you mentioned, Dorothy, or, or you mentioned the networking, getting involved with some of the um, uh, organizations, student organizations. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I think that kind of helped me kind of get out of the, the, you know, not wanting to talk in front, you know, taking those type of classes. But, you know, short-term, long-term goals, those personal development classes, getting involved with some of the student um, um, groups that you have on campus, you know, and I definitely re reward, you know, there's not a, a month I don't get a good dive of piece of chocolate. Mm -hmm. Just, you know, and I'm not in school anymore. That's just <laughs> because I want to, you know. So getting, you know, doing some of those things, it, it helped me a lot in school. The, the only thing I can add to that is that, and, and I tell this to my students, is, is goes back to our first presenter, what Dwayne said, is know who you are. And why is that important? And to your question is because knowing who you are, then you learn about what learning style you have. And learning style is very important because greens learn different, you know, if you're, and we're talking about two colors. If you're green, you need data, you need more information. Uh, if you're orange, you're probably a little bit more practical. If you're an extrovert, you need to hear yourself out. You know, if you're introvert, you need to process information. So just understanding who you are as a person and how you learn would help you in those classes. And then you take, we have a, here at Long Beach City College, we have a, a Counseling 49 class that would teach you techniques, you know, in the Counseling 48 class. Those are the techniques that would teach you. Go, I would definitely highly recommend the True Colors because it helps you not only individually, it helps you search careers, but more importantly in classroom, for your question, it really identify how the teacher's learning style is and how your learning style is, and it'll help you enhance your, your experience here. Thank you very much. Um, that concludes our career panel. I would like for everyone to fill out your evaluation form and turn it in at the check-in desk so that we can improve our services for next year. And also a reminder, at the colorful table behind you, we have handouts if you did not get a chance to pick those up. And a final reminder, we have our True Colors workshop available November 19th, which is a Thursday from 12.30 to 2.30. I would love for all of you to attend. Okay, um, and Dwayne has also said that he's willing to stay around here and if you have any questions or would like to speak to him individually. Thank you very much for your attendance.